Okay, then we can start. So he hello to everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Bostan Mikus, race director of uh, UTVV Slovenia. Uh, first, uh, I would like to let you know that this session is uh, recorded and will be later published. Uh, uh, otherwise, I'm here for technical questions at the end of the session, but the main purpose for today's webinar is training and preparation before the race. That's why the David Bond, the coach from the Camino Ultra is with us. Thank you, David. And I think it's time that you can present yourself and we can start. Excellent. Thank you, Bastian. Hello, everybody. How is everybody? I recognize a few people. Is Danny on here? My dear local friend, Demis. Hello, Demis. Nice to see everybody. Uh, what's amazing about this group is um, the genuine uh, kind of global nature of UTVV and the reach. Um, so yeah, spectacular race, amazing organization. And uh, yeah, we've got an hour together. So um, I will just introduce a couple of things, but um, like with most of these sessions, you'll see the chat, hopefully everybody. So feel free to jump on there and say, David, get your haircut, um, you know, this is my question for today. You know, I'm very inexperienced or I'm very experienced. So we can kind of gauge where you're at. So do not feel embarrassed to ask, you know, really simple questions because that's the nature of what we love is we want to help people at, you know, every single level. So yes, my name is David. I am one of the co-founders of a company in the UK called Camino Ultra and uh, I've been lucky enough to do quite a few things with Alex and with the UTVV team and one of the things that we have collaborated on is a three-month training plan and as as the team told me tonight we're actually uh, three months minus four days <laughs> until the race so if you've signed up yeah, you're technically slightly under the three months, but um, as we hope to discuss this evening, uh, do not panic. <laughs> um, a, a, a few things about the um, the training plan. So a Alex has already put up there where you can get access to the um, to the ebook if you don't currently have the ebook, and um, what we did is. You know, I think most of you, like myself, are probably quite inquisitive, quite curious about your own running and your experience. And you probably spend a lot of time going onto the Internet and you Google all kinds of stuff and you get all kinds of information back. So, that, that, I mean, there's a lot of good resources that already exist and there are actually a lot of very good what I would call very sensible generic training plans so you know if you're going to do your first 50k or 100k you know you can you can print off and you stick on your fridge you know a, a quite sort of sensible plan which will refer to kind of mileage and it will give you a good sense of as how to structure your week and obviously, if you've never seen this before and you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, then maybe after this session, you could uh, you could private message and we can help you out. But on the basis that all of you have got some experience, um, what we tried to do with the ebook was to give you um, an additional set of things to be thinking about. So and again, that's where we want to focus on on tonight's session which is what are the things that you should be considering now and you should be factoring in for the next kind of few weeks um, that will go alongside the things that you're probably doing well, which is running uh, the mileage that you're running, maybe some strength and conditioning. So, yeah, we're talking about uh, nutrition. Uh, we are definitely talking about uh, mindset. 
uh, if you've ever been to the mountains of uh, Slovenia, <laughs> you'll know that that can often be, uh, uh, you know, a sort of level of concern and fear in terms of your own skill set and expertise of mountain running. Uh, before this session started, we were talking, talking about uh, trainers and trail shoes. And so, yeah, very much talking about kind of kit, what kit we believe is, uh, you know, kind of suitable for the types of um, training that, uh, you know, you may be undertaking. So, yeah, I think, Alex, at this point, weren't we, we're going to kind of open up the floor a little bit, um, see if anybody have got any sort of specific questions to to kick us off Alex or yeah there, there are more there are more people joining now uh, okay another 30 Good. Um, yeah I think the, the first question can be how many people sign up I'll do a poll so we know okay. where we are um just give me a minute and a, a, a poll will uh, pop up on your screen uh one minute Cool. So we get, uh, and if you could write in the, the um, comment section, from where are you? So we know from what country are you? Are you Slovenia, UK? Um, so we get to know each other a bit better. Macedonia, <clears throat> nice. So the poll launched, if you can uh, answer if you sign up to UTV. Austria, Netherlands, India, Oxford. One of, wow. my, one of my athletes has just dialed in. Sarah. Sarah from Oxford. Hello, my friend. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How you feeling? Camera on and show you. I'm feeling a bit rough, actually. Oh, mate. Not too bad, but hello. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, buddy. So did everybody reply to the 70% uh, you responded? Um, nice. Uh, so 72% uh, sign up for UTV, 11% no, and 17%, uh, 17, 20% thinking about it. A uh, couple of more left to, if you, if you all answer, it will be easier for us to know uh, where you are in your journey. And if you have any questions, uh, obviously you can start uh, asking David. Slovenia, Belgium, Slovenia. <laughs> that, that Danny, Danny's just asked the question that was uh, front of my mind when I saw so many of you mentioning that you were from Belgium and the Netherlands. <laughs> and something that uh, is very dear to my heart as someone that lives in London is that there, there are no hills in London. I mean, uh, I'm a keen cyclist. I know there's a few little bumps in Belgium and and the Netherlands, but uh, not quite what we would consider to be the uh, the elevation that you uh, you are likely to face in UTVV or in a race like UTVV. So, what what are the kind of the main things? So, I mean, first of all, I, I think when you when you are you know focusing on this type of event it, it's it's more essential than anything to get very specific with the type of uh training and terrain that you're going to be experiencing in the race so obviously it, it's a luxury for most of us to be able to get to the same uh, area where the race is going to take place. I mean, for most of us, our first exposure of Slovenia will be going there for the race, obviously, <laughs> unless you're a local, of which a lot of you might be. But um, 
you know, there is just basically no substitute for trying to uh, look at the elevation profile of the race and to make some kind of calculations as to how you can get close to that elevation in some training runs. So, uh, I mean, as a coach, I've got some uh, some algorithms that would take a little bit too long to explain on this call. But obviously, if you're going to do, you know, one of the distances, the 50, you know, the 50, 60K, the 100K, the 100 mile, and try and work out roughly how many hours you hope uh, to be able to do the event in. Look at the elevation profile and try and work out, you know, how much elevation there is per hour. And then for, for many of you, you know, the key uh, element for each week is going to be the long run. It's going to be time on feet. It's going to be, um, you know, practicing nutrition and kit every single time that you do a long run. Don't ever attempt to do one of your long runs between now and the race and not take the opportunity to be practicing these things. Um, you are, you're in a current position where you've got enough time to, to be a little bit playful. So, you know, if you're not a hundred percent, um, you know, happy with like nutrition or you want to try some new nutrition, um, now's the perfect time to do it. Obviously, if you're about to buy some new kit, obviously trainers being pretty critical, but um, maybe Boss Jan and the team could talk a little bit about poles or any specific kit that they feel they've seen a lot of um, of their runners use. But I mean, now's the time to be, um, you know, purchasing that kit or or borrowing that kit, trying that stuff. You You, you mustn't be doing this in you know in two months time you know when we get uh two months time further down the line you, you should have everything pretty much known as to you know what you know how you're going to be approaching this race you've tested your kit you've tested your strategies and your scenarios so yeah they, these are the things that you could be doing now but yeah mindful of the elevation you know make the effort to travel from where you live if you live in flat terrain um you know uh be safe obviously if there are forums where you can in the utv world say i'm also from belgium or the netherlands and you know maybe one or two of you can buddy up and go together uh i i strongly advise that you know we're still in what i would call the winter months which means that the weather is highly unpredictable. Uh, we're getting constant storms and snow, ice, uh, frost fog. Uh, there have been some very unfortunate incidents that have happened in mountain regions recently. So yeah, be safe um, when, you're, when you're going to new areas, when you're perhaps less familiar. Uh, let people know where you are. Uh, you know, be sensible with your with your navigation, you know, don't undertake too many risky things, you know, try and find things where, you know, you can learn and, and practice. Alex, got another one, buddy. So there's one uh, that Marco is asking. I've run 56K in one day and 140K in four days. How to move from this to the 100k so i guess he ran 50k 56k in one day and 140k in four days how do you move from that to 100k um i mean that's a great that's a really great question because I, i'd imagine that most people have got their own version of that question so it's the same question but with slightly different numbers and I, first of all i'd say to marco exceptional you know, basically, those numbers are absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, he obviously is learning a lot about his own running and his own uh, capabilities by already doing. Uh, yeah, see. Uh, Hello. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there's there's no um, 
obviously there's no exact science uh for for this type of stuff you know what what i often say to people that i coach it it's you know there is um I'll give you an example from a race that I was at at the weekend. So, I mean, some of you may or may have not heard of um, backyard ultras. So these are becoming very popular around the world where you, you start on the hour and you have to run uh, a four mile loop. So a 6K loop. And then you come back to the start and you have to be prepared again to uh, start the next hour. If you don't start the next hour, you're out. And the race keeps going until there are only two people left. And then basically when one pulls out, the, the last person standing has to complete one more lap to be the winner. And basically everybody else is deemed to be uh, a non-finisher. <laughs> it's a bit cruel. But uh, in the, what, what's really interesting, and I, I strongly advise people to look at these events because what you're actually doing is you're actually being forced to control your pace and your distance for four miles and 6k now you know what i see a lot of people do and i'm sure a lot of people do in utvv is they go off too fast and then they don't have the energy in order to either complete the event, hence DNF, or finish in a way that they would like to, you know, they don't feel kind of strong and confident. Actually, like the format of the Backyard Ultra, it forces you to basically have a, a run, walk, recovery strategy. Because if you would, if you ran as fast as you could and you got back to the start line, then you have to wait until that hour starts. If you go very slowly and you come back with a few seconds before the end, then you've got to go again. You have no time to eat and you've got no time to change your kit. So, you know, that's a mindset that you need to take into your training and practice and into the event. So it the person that came second in the in the event I saw at the weekend, his longest ever run was um 50 kilometers so 30 miles and at the weekend he did 100 miles so 100k so he he took himself his mindset from you know 30 miles to 100 100 you know 50k to 160k and i'd say to all of you you could all do that i'm pretty certain almost every person on this zoom call tonight could uh using a few tools <laughs> a few things they've practiced uh you know in a really positive mindset um go way beyond the distance that you've ever done in training before but it doesn't happen by magic <laughs> i mean you've all taken the uh positive step to join this call tonight at i'm sure that is representative of the type of people you are that you know, want to learn and you're curious. And so, you know, the level that Marco's already doing, I would say that, you know, based on everything I've ever observed, you know, when you, be, when you find race conditions, when you're part of a race, you know, when you've got all the incredible volunteers that, that, that UTVV have who want you to finish, and you know what amazing stuff there is at the finish, you know, you it you can go way beyond your training levels. So again, I, I recognize that, you know, for a lot of you, and I, I'm no different, you want to know, don't you? You want to know, I'm about to do a 200 mile race in four weeks time. And I'd love to do a hundred mile training run this weekend. <laughs> so I could feel more confident but it's never going to happen. So I've just got to, I got to trust in my coach and my process that what we've done is enough from a training perspective. Awesome. So that another question we have from Sasha is what is a good training volume for the 100 mile race? I'm currently doing, doing on average around 100 kilometers per week. 
yep. with 4,000, 4,500 meters of elevation. And I'm planning to work up to 120 to 130 kilometers week in March. Then slowly start the tempering, tampering process in April. Is this a good plan? First, third wish is, of course, to finish the race. The second yep. is to do it. Ah, okay, so the first wish is to finish the race. And the second is we uh, wish is to finish under around 32 um, hours. Yeah. So there's, I mean, it's a, another brilliant question. I think there's um, there's three important things that I want to pick out of that question, yeah, that I hope apply to everybody here on the call tonight. I mean, first of all, um, you really, really need to sit down. I've seen lots of really good athletes get a pen and a paper and they write this stuff down so they don't tap on the keyboard or think it in their head. Danny's got a pen. Well done, Danny. And you actually write down how you hope the UTV race is going to go. So you've got an idea of how many hours. Well, you know, you know the cutoffs. So you know the how long the race is allowing you to have. And you have, you know, you have your own belief system as to whether you well, you just want to finish, which is amazing, you know, full respect to finishers, especially if you're taking on the emperor. Um, and some people will want to do, you know, that may have done the race before or have done similar distances before, and they'll set much tougher goals in terms of times. So once you've kind of got that understanding, that can then help you work backwards with these questions of like, you know, where is my current training? And, um, you know, where do I want to potentially push it to in order to be a more confident or, you know, to have a stronger belief system that you can achieve the things that you've written down. So um, what, what I will say is that, you know, I, I suspect that a lot of you on this call, you're not new to running but you might be new to the distance that you've signed up to do. So what you really should not be doing is massively increasing your training, your weekly distance at this point. You should be sensibly increasing it at a level that is going to be healthy for you and, you know, and, and, and gives you a, you know, a, a nice increase towards your dream goals you know if you're if you you're currently doing you know uh 50 miles 80k a week you know there's absolutely no way between now and the race so i want you to be doing 100 miles i mean and just because the guy in your club or the you know the woman in that on strava is doing that and they're also doing this race it's totally irrelevant it's totally you know this is all you are all unique I genuinely, you're all very special human beings, even for signing up for these events. But, you know, let try and work out your own plan that in the next couple of months sees a nice increase, both in the miles that you do and maybe some of the interval sessions where you're looking at, uh, you know, um, being kind of mindful of the of the benefits of speed and i would definitely be encouraging you all to have a strength and conditioning program uh inside of your running now i'm personally not a huge fan of having excessive strength and conditioning plans because i believe we're runners and that we're signing up to a running race so i would want you to be running in hills hill practice with your kit trying your nutrition that's what i want you to be doing but it is beneficial you know once you if you're signing up for that 100 mile race there's going to be some moments when you you wish you were a bit stronger and you get a bit stronger by doing some nice weights and some nice so again i'm sure via the utvv team we can uh over the next few weeks if any of you are kind of new to any of these subjects uh, we can share some content that is um, uh, sensibly kind of introductory level. Like I say, don't, don't, don't Google one hour 
kettlebell over the head sessions <laughs> and then email us to say you've got a massive shoulder injury you know you should be doing five minute ten minute sessions really easy and if this is new to you obviously the best thing you can ever do is find a coach for everything you do a nutrition coach strength coach running coach obviously nobody does that because it's very expensive <laughs> but do you know what i mean you 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 have the same mentality don't you you shouldn't just be doing stuff off the internet you should be seeking advice and working with professionals and trying to build up slowly you know so yeah great question um uh, and that and leads us to the next question, David. Uh, Joseph is asking, what is a good day for a leg workout in the training week? Right now, I'm doing one long run, one workout yeah. tempo, yeah. three easy runs, leaving two rest days. Not sure on when to fit specific strength training. And by the way, if you have a question, I think we can you can um, ask yourself. I mean, we can hear your voice and see you. I think it will be better than me reading. Uh, <laughs> so I think yeah, better we can do it because there's a couple of questions coming in. So yeah. that's the next question. Basically, uh, it's a good transition into from previous question. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in two subjects here because we haven't talked about them yet. So first of all, um, obviously, again, you're you're all individuals. So you know, I, I'm mindful that uh, you know most people that I talk to are trying to balance uh, life with their their kind of running goals you know so I, I couldn't say to you all do strength and conditioning on a Wednesday could I because some of you are working some of you have got kids some of you have chosen to do your long run in the week rather than the weekend but um what what I would suggest is that you try and um there's always a good a good weekly structure has a long run of course because you're all ultra runners it has a speed session and it has a recovery session and what i would do is try and avoid the strength and conditioning uh one that came before either the long run or the speed session so if you can avoid that so that you're most fresh for your long run and your uh interval session that's perfect. So if it needs to be, it's either separated out or it comes afterwards. Um, the other thing I would say is that, so a subject that we haven't talked about so far is um, your own personal understanding about what is easy and what is hard. So, you know, as we, as many of us know in the ultra marathon world, <laughs> some of the people that win the same races that we enter, <laughs> they've gone home <laughs> a long time before we've potentially finished. I mean, like humans are astonishing at the different levels at which they're doing these things. So one of the concepts that you must all ask yourself is like, you know, actually is my training easy? You know, have I, have I just finished another session and it was actually not that hard? Actually a lot, you know, the events that you're likely to be signing up to in UTVV, they're not going to be easy. 100k or 100 miles in those mountains it's going to be extremely hard so you, you have to get that concept of hard into your training so the mistakes that i see a lot of athletes make is that they they look at their day and they look at the um the weather report and they go oh looks quite nice and sunny at 10 o'clock or you know it's another Wednesday and I'm meeting a friend and we're meeting at six o'clock again. But in, in the race itself, you know, you're going to be out for hours. You know, you're going to be typically, you know, a nighttime scenario, early scenario. So, and, and you need to be practicing those things. So, you know, whilst I'm saying to you in the perfect world where we're all, you know, full of time, you know, there's nothing else going on in our lives, nobody bothering us. And I say, oh, this is the time I'm going to do my run today. Actually, you know, rip up that rule book and actually go at a time where the weather looks the worst that day. You know, rejoice. Go hallelujah. This could be like stormy mountain weather. Get your kit on, 
and go and experience the worst weather you know go and do a strength conditioning session after your long run you know what does it feel like so not, don't do it all the time but don't be looking for easy all the time you know like i said so you you know how how are you pushing yourself you know i've seen i don't know if you guys are familiar with um a podcast uh by uh, a guy called uh, andrew huberman and he is a sort of prolific investigator into you know the science around health and you know maximizing what we've got and and all all the evidence points to the fact that we can do something you know ridiculously harder than we believe we can you know and again it's a mindset you know you might feel like you've trained only to a to a level of 60 percent but you know you you can carry yourself the other 40 percent with with a strong mindset you know you can you can look to be pushing yourself you know like i say not not excessively that one of david huberman's uh sorry andrew huberman's latest podcast is with a guy called david goggins and if you've ever heard of david goggins i mean i always think like you could have a david goggins on one shoulder and huberman on the other i mean he swears a lot but he everything that you do would never be good enough for goggins and you kind of need to have a sort of double mentality going on with your own training regime you know don't slip into habits you know don't make every week look the same that's dreadful don't run around the same route all the time you know go somewhere completely different take the opportunity to expose yourself to something new go and do it you know get a gpx off one of the websites of a route you've never done before go and do it at midnight and and go and live with the animals you know get a little bit like i said they, and this i'm not i'm not saying this without you know recognizing you know it's not easy but you know like I say what you've signed up to do at utvv could throw all kinds of crazy stuff at you so you know getting outside of your comfort zone is a is a superpower and you know bolster your superpower now yeah cool um so I think the next question is more for Bostian because it's about Mar Mar Margin asked how Mar Margin do you want to unmute yourself and ask yourself uh, yeah I think it will be better of course yeah, yeah I'm uh, uh, I'm from uh, the Netherlands um, and I did uh, some ultra marathons um, but not uh, not 100k I did 50k and for the 100K, I'm not that fast, so I'm trying to finish in 30 hours. Um, and I'm asking myself, when you're 30 hours on the way, do you, uh, how, how do you um, experience uh, the lack of sleep? And can you um, uh, train it or just experience it during the race? Uh, shall I answer that one first, Alex? Yeah, David, you can ask that question. There was another question yeah. by Margin. I think you have a similar oh. name about the course. So David, ask, ask, answer that question, and then we'll yeah. move to the, to the other question. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's a brilliant question, isn't it? I um, I I did a race uh in the UK last year, which was um set seven days long, and um, you if you wanted to, you could do you could have no sleep, but obviously, uh, humans uh need to have some sleep. So, um, yeah, so I did a lot of research into other behaviors of athletes in that particular race, but in general for sleep. And the overall, my advice is that, uh, in, and again, in my experience, is that I, I, I typically think that most of us can cope going 24 hours without sleep. Uh, it's not nice. <laughs> but we can do it a after 24 hours we need to have a strategy so again what i would say to that brilliant question is um do your research in terms of the course you know you don't want to be falling asleep at the top of the mountain when two hours before there was a hut 
and some nice volunteers who said to you, why don't you just sit down there and have a coffee and have a lie down? So like know where you are in the, what, what a brilliant thing. These volunteers are incredible humans. Every time you see a volunteer, ask them a question. You know, am I near this? How far have I got to go to this? You know, will there be more food at the next place? Know, know what in these type of races, if you're going to be out for 30 hours, you know, learn that stuff inside the race. But I would say, I would say there's a strong possibility you could go for the full 30 hours without a sleep. Uh, but be mindful that, you know, if you're beginning to feel uh, the uncomfortable and, and, and slightly worrying nature of sleep deprivation. So there's a lot of stuff written out there about hallucinations. And actually, I can tell you that some hallucinations are really good fun and they they make for a really good story afterwards. But obviously, if you see, you know, if you're on a mountainside and your ability to follow the trail or the course, you know, is jeopardized by this feeling that you must react upon it, mustn't you? You must take the sensible precautions. Obviously, if you if you can buddy up with someone else or if you're already with someone, get them to check in on you, be safe. But um, yeah, I, like I said, I don't think you need, you don't need to have a strong um, preemptive approach. You know, you, you know, none of us would be tired inside a normal uh, sleep cycle. It's more when you get beyond that 24 hour period. And to your other point, you can't practice it. Uh, actually, what they say to you, so like um, a week before UTVV, get the best sleep you've ever had in your life turn off the tv don't go out nap in the afternoon make sleep your superpower you'll only get the benefit from it one week before the race it makes no difference doing it now you won't become a super sleeper by doing this stuff now but like like heat training and sleep training your body will respond to it in a heightened fashion if you can do it the sort of seven days to 10 days before the race so yeah be as rested as you can be um yeah be safe out there oh thank you and uh, margin Mar markman do you want to ask uh, unmute yourself and ask the, uh, the question if you're here yeah uh, i'm i'm here can you hear me yeah <clears throat> Yes, can, can you hear, hear me? Mark? Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah we can hear you. Yeah, basically, David already uh, uh, answered a lot of questions. Um, it's it's really hard to prepare yourself in, in a certain way. I was just curious about the, the, the parkour, um, how, how the underground is basically. Um, it's mainly gravel, or is a lot of rocks and boulders. Um, and secondly, how are the markings uh, on the course? Is is are they easy to 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 see, or do you need a navigation uh, device or, or or a map or something? So I will ask this uh, uh, answer you this question. Um, so you are asking for the Emperor route, or which uh, distance you are interested in? The the hundred ten k, hundred ten uh, kilometers. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So the main the main part of the uh, the race is single trails, on the on the grass and also some rocks in between. Uh, the one ridge is a rocky ridge, but it's not uh, dangerous or uh, vertical problems. Uh, let's say that around seventy percent of the trails are single trails, uh, twenty percent are gravel and dirt roads, and ten percent of tarmac. Uh, so roughly. And regarding the marking, this is very well uh, marked. So we have a standard of mark to place uh, mark uh, marking flags or tapes uh, in each uh, 30 meters. So you don't need any nav navigation device, but it's recommended to have a watch so you can uh, uh, you can uh, check if you are on the track if you somehow miss the, the trace. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, okay. that's my question. So, basically, if you if you haven't seen uh, a marker after fifteen minutes, you hardly went wrong. Yeah. 
actually okay, if you thanks. have it, yes thank you so if you can't see the marking after 100 meters you need to go back and return to the last marking and then change the direction okay but thank you very much you're welcome Awesome. The next question is Stemis. Stemis, do you want to ask the question? You need to unmute yourself. Hey guys. Hey David. Uh, I think my the, the gentleman earlier he pretty much replied. Uh, I wasn't aware, so I was asking David how steep are the hills? If it would require to do any scrambling, I mean, I'm this type of a person that I would enjoy that. Uh, so from my understanding, there is no lots of scrambling or bouldering <clears throat> but if there's not uh, i would like to ask david based on his experience how do you usually approach a scenario like that where for example i missed uh, snowdonia unfortunately that all the slots were booked and a friend of mine told me there was quite a bit of bouldering mm. so uh yeah thank you so much yeah yeah so thanks thanks demis i think um again I mean, the fact that you guys have taken this opportunity to join this call and having the amazing, uh, you know, the the organisers of, of the race, you know, th th this is exactly what you need to do, you know, Themis, if you were to do like uh, the Ultra Trail Snowdonia, they're, they're, these races, they're just so different. You know, it's, you know, I, I, with, with the respect from the guests on here from Macedonia and from Belgium, you know the bogs in one country and the moss and and the mountain sides uh, and as you say the scramble and the boulders uh, they just sort of look and they feel and they they react differently so yeah with respect you know that the, the dream is to to be specific isn't it so um to get to get the experience uh, in the actual place where you're going to do um, the race. Um, mate, other than that, you've just got to try your best, haven't you? And find, uh, you know, the, the closest uh, equivalent, you know. So, for example, obviously in the UK, I'd be recommending that, you know, if you were near the lakes, you'd go to the lakes, wouldn't you? Because that would be near Wales. And obviously, if someone was in the UK, I'd be highly recommended and they made the effort to go to one of those places um, rather than what's in, in England, which is probably not um, as, as sufficient as the type of terrain you're going to get in Slovenia. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, you, uh, the great thing is that ultimately um, we all want a challenge, don't we? We all want to try something new and it's totally fine to be experiencing some of these things for the first time in the race. You know, if you've got if you've got most of the other things well practiced, you know, you feel very comfortable with your kit because obviously, you know, in these mountain races, you, you know, you you pay close attention to the weather in the week leading up to the race, you know, and, and you've you've you know, if it's going to be very wet or you know, very icy or whatever then you take the right level of kind of uh, precautions. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, if, you, if you're in a hotel and all you can do is the Stairmaster, then just get on the Stairmaster, yeah? <laughs> Crack on. <laughs> Thank you. Always wise uh, word from you. Thanks, Themis. Yeah. I, I would just suggest, Themis, like if you're in the UK, I would suggest traveling to Slovenia. Um, and just doing like a weekend um, recce uh, with someone from the UK. The tickets are very cheap. It's like 15, 20 pounds. Um, but the other than that, um, because I, I have the same issues as you, so traveling to Slovenia is very easy. Um, the other question is from K KP. Do you want to ask it? No, unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm new to the trail running. And I would like to know, is the running using usage of the pole very important in the trail running or we need some kind of practice or we can directly use during the race? Um, we should, uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. I'll, I'll, I'll answer first, but it's really important that Bostian um, gives you some specifics around UTVV. Um, when um, I coach a lot of people in, in the UK, I, I don't always recommend polls 
I think I think you've got it. You know, there's a there's a bit of a trend at the moment to buy poles. You know, they look really cool in the pictures. You know, you think, oh, it must be really epic because they've got poles. But, um, you know, for lots of reasons, as we're just saying, uh, Themis's last question, if you're if you're not really doing most of your training somewhere where it's helpful or you know useful to use poles um you know it's not necessarily sensible or safe to be using them for kind of like the first time when you're in the race um uh one of the things that i've experienced a lot is that um people actually get a, a lot of injuries using poles because again running is a sport where we use our legs and and we just don't have uh the strength the upper body strength or we, we don't know how to use poles correctly and we get actually quite severe repetitive strain injury so for you know if you're out for 30 hours and you start to get major pains in your wrists and your shoulders and you find you dnf because of poles rather than the running you know highly highly frustrating but um, Boss Jan, in your experience, what what's the split between those that uh, use poles and or maybe don't use poles in the race? Actually, yes, for the UTVB, for the longest distances, almost every runner uses poles because there are some steep parts uh, yeah. that can help you. Maybe I can refer also to Temish question uh, about the, how steep the terrain is. It's not so steep that you need to scramble, like uh, climbing, but uh, it's steep steep enough that you usually use uh, poles for uh, uphilling. Yeah. But yeah, definitely uh, for the guy who KP, uh, as David say, you need to be trained before using uh, uh, poles. But uh, if I re refer to Josef Janczoszek question or que uh, comments in UTV, uh, it's allowed to use a pose. So don't worry, you can use pose. Stra strangely, one, one of the things you should practice, uh, again, <laughs> which which I don't see a lot of, what a lot of people do when they go out, you know, they they travel somewhere because it's hilly and they have a pair of poles and a lot of the new poles, like the lecky poles, they 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 fold away, so you can put them in your bag or sleeve. So you get the poles put together, and they just think right, and they just spend the whole time with the poles because they basically can't be bothered to unfold them and put them away. But actually, what that you should be practicing that with as much discipline as you do the other things. You know, there are long sections in most races where it's unnecessary to have poles. So you need to practice, you know, obviously if you, if the weather is not good, you know, this idea of like stopping and, you know, knowing where things are in your bag and being uh, comfortable where things are so you can get access to them comes from practice. So yeah, if you've got some poles, you know, start your, your practice run without the poles and then, know where you're going to get them out use them as Boschan says for a really steep bit but then you know maybe put them away again just kind of get familiar with that idea of like you know you know don't just use it for the whole training day just because you brought a very expensive pair of leckies <laughs> you know just use them for when you're in the hill and like i said you know i i've spent a lot of time with um several kind of biomechanic uh coaches and they they say the human was built without poles strange that isn't it so like most of us when we get a pair of poles we become like like you know like when you're really old and you've got like a little walking frame so, which is not good so you've got to you've got to have that sort of mindset how are you going to become efficient with these things which we aren't really very well used to using as boss chan says if you've got a very steep bit and you kind of giving you a, a sort of purpose, then yeah, maybe that's great. If something is very sketchy and you're using it as a sort of safety, you know, what kind of terrain's coming up if it's very boggy and you don't want to fall into a bog up to your neck, I'd say poles are pretty cool. But then, you know, don't be 
getting very tired and inefficient banging a pole down 20 hours into UTVV if it's not making you feel like the most uh, efficient version of yourself. And as I said earlier on in the call today, you know, if any of you are going to do this, do this now, yeah? Borrow a pair now, next two weekends, try it out. Does it work for you? You know, don't buy a pair of poles in six weeks' time because there's a sale on and then use them a week before the race, you know, just because you want to keep them clean. <laughs> don't do that. Um, Five minutes left, Alex. Any other questions? Yeah. Buddy? Uh, if anyone has a question, you can obviously unmute yourself. Um, in the meantime, maybe I'll ask I'll ask a question about nutrition. Obviously, if you're doing 100K yep. or 60K, how many carbs per hour do people need to eat? Because I think a lot of times nutrition is something that's overlooked when yep. doing long distances. So I, I, how can people know how many carbs they need or how, how much food they need, not just you know, on checkpoints? What, what, one of the one of the many things that I love about uh, ultra marathon races is how your how your brain turns to mush, and you go, oh, what what did that say? Was it sixty carbs? Was it seventy two carbs? Was it was it four miles an hour? Was it sixteen miles? You know, like you you'll, you'll never remember any of that rubbish, yeah. So the so your to answer your question, that's going to be beneficial for most people on this call, you know. The number one thing you must all practice this weekend and every weekend before the race is to eat. You will not be doing 100K well, like trying to be some fasted superhuman, you know, like our body, your body will respond best. It will keep going. It will travel most efficiently if you keep feeding it. So don't be one of these people that goes out for a two hour, three hour run at the weekend going, oh, aren't I brilliant? <laughs> I just did that and I didn't eat anything. Don't be a fool. Eat food, go out and run. You know, you're a long distance ultra runner, not a marathon runner. You need to be going into aid stations and eating. You need to be walking out of aid stations, eating. You need to be thinking about hour by hour. You know, as the race goes on, you're you like you you will notice that a lot of people eat less because it's it's just not nice, is it? You know, you've had enough of gels, you've had enough of bananas or this, that, and the other. So you know, try a bit of variety. You know, make sure that you know you've got some backup plans. You know, so uh, you know maybe you like mostly sweet stuff but maybe you need to practice some savory stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, boss Jan, can you tell us what, what kind of foods, uh, will the guys most likely get on the aid stations? Yes, uh, actually in the aid stations, on almost all aid stations, there are bananas, uh, nuts, uh, these dry foods, uh, salami, salami cheese, but, uh, some of the aid stations has also, uh, hot meals. Uh, especially for the imperial race, two to uh, station has uh, hot meals, so like a uh, minestra, something like this. A stew. A stew, yes. Nice. Thank you, Anya. Uh, yes, and uh, and also soups. Uh, soups are uh, all around the on uh, the tracks. So yeah. Uh, Energy gels, gels and uh, energy drinks are also uh, available on uh, all uh, aid stations. Sounds good. So what what I'd recommend um, is you 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 think of things by the hour, and that maybe you split the hour up into two sections. Yeah. So what I would typically do in a you know 10, 20, 30 hour race is potentially have a gel or a bar or or a bit of banana and what i always do is i always try and consume that over a five ten minute period so one of the things that makes a lot of people sick and, and actually vomit is that they just think they're going to just quickly just take the whole gel or the whole banana or they would go into the beautiful aid station 
and they would wallop a whole bowl of stew. And then often what you'll find is that when you when you're sick or you need the toilet, it kicks off a chain reaction of you needing to be sick more and use the toilet more. So to avoid that, introduce the foods into your stomach slowly. So if you can hold a gel and you could take it into three, you know, you'd have a slurp, wait a few minutes. Obviously, it's not easy and it's a bit annoying because then you've got to hold the wrapper and stuff like that. But in, it, it's worth it in the long term. And again, practice this stuff. Yeah. So I would have something like food based in in one of my 30 minutes. And then I would have ideally some kind of um, uh, liquid in the other and i personally like uh powders so like you know certain brands just offer up quite a sort of good good return and there's certain brands which have got a really nice balance between um salts and electrolytes which is another really important thing for an event like utvv if this is a concept you've never come across before you know you need to have a little bit of an understanding of your own sweat and your own salts intake so uh you can buy these things called salt tabs from any any shop any pharmacy and um in a very hot race probably be good to have a more frequent intake of salt tabs and even in a cold race when you think you should you don't need them you need to have a few of them you know in long distance races you need to be regulating, you know, your your water, your salt, your electrolytes. And I, I just find in that hour, I quite like a balance, you know, so there's a kind of constant flow going in, but it's not a huge amount. And it's kind of like over over a period, you know. So so, yeah, in your in your long run at the weekends, do that every time, you know, never go out without this stuff and and uh, and practice it. All right, and last two questions uh, because we have to wrap up. Jose is asking, what sports drinks do you have? That's, I guess, for Boshtian. And then um, which brands to test out? Also, if you have gels, which brand? Actually, yes, uh, I saw these uh, questions. We will have a sport drinks as every edition we have and also the gels and the uh, energy bars but we cannot uh, talk about brands right now so we are not uh, it's not confronted so. <laughs> but we, definitely we will let you know in the following weeks all right and what do you recommend to store at the two baggage drop drops I, marco i think it's for david uh, or Bostian, no, no. Bostian. Bostian very good this one Maybe I can pick it up. This is means the drop bags or transition bags, oh. which are we are, uh, we are uh, offering one transition transition bags or drop bags for 100k and uh, two for imperial race. So we recommend uh, additional so spare uh, clothes, uh, your own food. So if you if you have your gels, as Joe's uh, ask, if you don't want our brands uh, to digest the gels, you can uh, spare your or you can store your uh, gels and electrolytes and so on. But uh, I I would recommend also uh, additional um, shoes, uh, additional spare uh, clothing, uh, additional uh, jackets because you never know. It depends on the weather, but if the weather is bad or maybe it's uh, forecasted to be bad, I think you can uh, store additional clothes for you in the middle of the race. Uh... All right, Alex. Final final top tip from me. Yeah. In the in the bag drop, so pack a toothbrush with some toothpaste. So, so for Marco and the other people that are going to be out there for 30 or plus hours, uh, when you get into close to the night or 24 hours, brush your teeth, you'll feel a million dollars. You'll feel like you've just started the race from the beginning. So uh, it's a top tip. All the, all the professionals, Courtney DeWalter, she swears by it. So yeah, brush your teeth. That's amazing. Um, well, 
if you have uh, more questions, you can always, uh, we have to wrap it up. You can always reach uh, to David, uh, David Bowen at Camino. He's an amazing coach. Obviously, if you need coaching as well, you can reach to David. If you want to book um, UTV, just go now and book it. If you have any <laughs> questions, for Stian, you can send us a message on any social channels. And yeah, let Bostian wrap it up. Yes. Uh, thank you, David. And thank you, Alex, for uh, this session. Uh, David, it was amazing listening to you. Uh, and thank you for all who participating in this session with all these brilliant uh, questions. I'm very happy to host you. And uh, yes, if you have any question regarding QTVV, you can uh, shoot us a mail on the info at ultratrail.si and we will be there for you good luck everybody have an amazing race yeah thank you thanks Bye. Bye.